David Sloan. The date is September 13th, 2011. I'm with Mr. Jack Reynolds uh, at his address on 9315 Leaside Drive in Dallas, Texas. Uh, this is an interview for the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission's uh, Liberators Project. Mr. Reynolds, thank you for sitting down with me today to do this interview. Well, thank you for coming. You've come a long way. And well, it's worth it. I'm, I'm excited to, to hear what you have to share with us because I know your story is a, is a fascinating one. So. Uh -huh. I don't know about that, but I, <laughs> I hope my voice will carry out. Yeah, we'll get we'll get you. It, boys. It's kind of messed up from this problem, you know. Yes, sir. Well, I, I'd like to start if we can go back. I'd like to know a little bit about uh, your early childhood. If you could tell me a little bit about uh, your childhood and your family uh, and your life there in South Dakota. Okay. Well, I was raised in Canton, South Dakota. Born in 1924, and grew up there. And uh, lived there until I was 14, 1938. And um, my father and grandfather were in a filling station and garage business. But my father went on the road for the same company that they, whose products they handled. I see. And he traveled. Uh, parts of three states, all of South Dakota, all of North Dakota, and part of Minnesota. So we, he got home about every other weekend. Was, and uh, I usually had a, a job of some kind when I was growing up. Uh, delivered the Saturday Evening Post and the Country Gentleman and Ladies Home Journal. And the Saturday Evening Post was five cents a copy and that's how I got my spending money. Now were you, you able to keep that money for yourself or did that go to the family? I, I kept it for myself. Yeah. All, all cent and a half out of the five cents. Well, yeah. You, well, we had talked earlier. We were, yeah. Some 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 people weren't that fortunate. Yeah, yeah. I know. Well, we would talk about. That's a good point to talk about. The yeah. depression was going on. Yeah. If you can talk a little bit, I know you were young, early on in the depression. But what are your memories of that? Well, I mean, that's. We didn't call it depression. We called it hard times. And, and it was, it was pretty much that. Um, the, my father and grandfather gave credit to their customers and of course it finally broke them but they, uh, the small merchants like that are, did a tremendous amount to keep the country afloat and they ran a, a Tank wagon, they called it, out into the country to, to deliver tractor fuel to the various farmers. They were switching over from horse farming to tractor farming. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so a lot of them, they built up some big credit bills and, and uh, they always figured when they got money they'd pay, they'd pay it, but uh, it didn't always work out that way, I guess. But uh, it, was, it was just the way things were. We just didn't have, have a whole lot of money, but uh, we were probably better off than most of the other people. Yeah. But when you got a little money in your pocket, what would you do with it? I'd go down and get an ice cream soda. That cost 25 cents, and that was about what I made in a week. It's good spending for a week's pay. <laughs> so did your uh, your older brother probably worked as well? Oh yes, yeah. yes he did. And 
And then when we got teenage, we both worked on farms. But I was in Iowa by that time, and you know, but uh, yeah, we both had to, you know, do whatever we could do to make a little money for ourselves. Well, you mentioned earlier when we were talking that 1938 was the hard, hardest of the hard years. Can you talk a little bit about that? My parents did not share their business with us. Uh, when they told us we were moving, we moved. And, and uh, my uh, whatever their conversations were, they had it to themselves. But I, I remember my dad built a trailer in our garage, in, in, the, in the business garage there. And we towed that to Texas with our necessary things, you know. And, uh, and then we lived in, a, in an apartment that my aunt had, rented that from her. And went to school there in Bryan for two years. And I played football one year and, and then tried to. <laughs> and, and then uh, delivered papers. Do you, do you remember when you heard that you were moving, what you're how you felt about it? Oh, I guess it was all right with me. Uh, <clears throat> I'd been in, in Bryan a few times when I was little, you know, about two and five and like that. But, but uh, it was all right. We, we towed that trailer down to, down to Bryan and you know, Dad came down for the holidays and that sort of thing. So how long did he stay up and continue to work? My work? Dad? Yeah. Well, he never did at that time move to Texas. Okay. Uh, we stayed in Texas for, the, for that two years, and by the end of that he had relocated to Iowa and kind of started over again. And, and he was, initially, of course, in South Dakota, he was selling uh, um, uh, uh, refinery products. Mm -hmm. And he had some other lines as well, uh, machinery. And so he was, he was selling machinery to filling stations and garages in in Iowa. Mm -hmm. The only thing was they weren't making any. They had switched over to wartime footing, you see. Yes. <coughs> so, he could sell anything he could find, he couldn't find anything to sell. And at the end of, and what my brother, of course, meantime, was in was at a &M, in and out of A&M. He had his own system going. He didn't work a semester and go to school a semester, you know. And uh, so uh, when uh, I graduated, I was offered a job in a shoe store that I'd been working in assistant manager for, I think, $25 a week. My brother wrote and said, come on down to the shipyard. And I told the folks that's where I was going, and Dad said, well, wait a week and I'll get, I'll take you down there. And so we ended up, all three of us, working in the shipyard. Mm -hmm. My brother in the engineering office, and my dad and I were chippers. And what that is is, you got a 
high frequency air hammer about this long uh, with cold chisels in it and you cut steel with it. Uh, all the fitting up welds that they had to make, you know, then you had to clean those off. And, and sometimes they'd have a bevel plates so where they could weld them together and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And that was very, very hard work. And uh, paid very well. Yeah, do you remember how much you were making? Yes. Uh, when, I, when they finally started hiring, they had some kind of labor problems to begin with. And they, had a, they gave a test. And I had been going to what was known as a shipbuilding school just learning how to use the chipping tools and everything and building up my strength a little bit. And they gave us a test and, and my dad, they hired him as first class and they hired me as third class. And that was uh, 78 cents an hour. And then after I'd been there a while, they promoted me to second class, and that was 87 cents an hour. And then after, I think, three months, I made first class, and that was a dollar and a quarter an hour. And that was, that was truly big money mm -hmm. in those days. Yeah. And you earned every penny of it, of course. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about what the work was like? Um... <clears throat> Well, you're using a cold chisel on steel, and there's a lot of that to be done when I'm around welding and, and everything, you know. These were some of the first welded ships mm -hmm. that were made. And so it, um, you had to hold that thing where it, where it couldn't bounce like a jackhammer, you know. If it bounced, you weren't cutting. And so you were using your muscles very, very much all, all the time. And uh, <clears throat> you, had, you know, there's a lot of heat from the sun on that steel and everything. And, mm -hmm. and, and so that they're working around the clock. You're working eight hours, to sh eight hour shifts around. Eight the clock. hour shifts. And uh, after we'd been there about three months, I guess, they started asking us to work overtime. And we never turned them down. So we ended up, with, and they paid time and a half after 40 hours, not after eight hours, but after 40 hours. And then um, time and a half if you work Saturday, double time if you work Sunday. And uh, so they started asking us to work overtime, you know. Mm -hmm. And so we were working 12 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, no, five days a week, and eight hours a day, two two days a week. Mm -hmm. yeah, and you, you were telling me you had to go out early because of all the traffic on the... Oh, yeah, yeah. Traffic was really bad. We had to start two hours early to get there on time and, and everything. You didn't want to clock in late because they dock you a whole bunch. Yeah. You know. Well, you but, know, one thing that I didn't ask about, so that's, you worked there for six months and that was in 40 or? 42. 42, yeah. Um, one thing I didn't ask you about was was Pearl Harbor. I know I know you remember. Well, I was a senior in high yeah. school, uh, in Council Bluffs when that happened, and uh, I remember the radio, you know, told us about it and everything. Do you remember what you felt or thought? Well, it made me mad. It made me mad. Incidentally, prior to that, 
and that fall we'd gone across the river to Omaha to watch a parade of the 7th Cavalry from Fort Meade, South Dakota. It was their last horse-drawn or mounted parade and, mm -hmm. and of course they also had, not, had all this motorized equipment as well. But that stuck with me pretty good. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. That was Custer's outfit, of course. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, so after your stint in Houston, did you you went back to uh, Bryan College Station? Right. Yeah, I went yeah. Uh, and started and A and &M. Yeah, rolled yeah, in A and M. And what course of study did you do at A and M? Uh, civil engineering. So why did you have an interest in that? Couldn't think of anything else. It's just about uh, almost literally true. I couldn't think of anything I wanted to do. My, my brother was <coughs> taking civil engineering, and and uh, I thought I'd try that. And one of the main problems was I didn't know what an engineer did. <laughs> I was a long time figuring that out. <laughs> you thought they drove the train, right? Well, yeah, but uh, some people think that, uh, that he's the one that pulls the little cord that goes toot toot, but actually the fireman did that, wasn't the engineer. Yeah, that's right. So, so what, uh, what do you remember from that time at, at A&M, that year at A&M? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't a year, it was... Yeah. Uh, well, I remember I couldn't get enough to eat. They, they, they fed just exceedingly well there, but just my... I was wound up pretty tight, I guess, at the time. And uh, there was... I was putting everything I had into it. And, and uh, that was... So I'm thinking I had a had two roommates and, and uh, one of them we on uh, Saturday morning. I think we had a class. We had a PE class on Saturday morning. I had to go out and run cross country. And yeah. And uh, so then uh, he and I, this one roommate and I, we'd go around this cross country and then they were about a mile in from the dormitory and we'd run the red, run back to the dormitory <laughs> and uh, take a shower and start hitchhiking out for the weekend. You know, we'd have a date someplace. That was our main mode of locomotion was was hitchhiking. We called it highwaying. Now that makes it sound more sophisticated. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it had, it had a lot of uh, informal rules and regulations, you know, for because if you didn't, there was. A, it would have been a chaos. You know. Well, you've got to share these. What are the, do you remember any of the informal rules and regulations? Well, yeah, you took your turn. You know, you put a bag down or something like that. You, you're placed in line. If somebody stopped to offer you a ride, nobody mobbed him. Only one person to go up to the car and ask him where he's going. And if he, he had the option of taking it or passing it on to somebody else in line. And, and that was one of the main things. And, the, and most of the main cities in Texas had an Aggie corner. And that's where you go to catch your ride. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was a no-no to 
go upstream of that point, but downstream was okay. <laughs> There's an etiquette involved. There was. Yeah. There was. It was, it was which incidentally, when I got uh, discharged from the Army, I hitchhiked all the way home from California. Three rides, I think it was. Three or four. Well, as, we, as we think about your time at A&M, so you left a and you were there for how long that first time? Probably half a semester. Half a semester. And then you left there. I still call myself a member of that class. But. Oh, do you? <laughs> so you left there to go where? Fort Sam Houston. Yeah. And from there I was sent to Camp Claiborne, Louisiana. Camp Claiborne uh, I became a member of the 398th Engineer Regiment General Service, which was just being formed. And everybody in it, except a very small cadre of non-coms, was rookies, including officers. And uh, that, that was kind of interesting. Since I had a little bit of uh, ROTC, both high school and and A and M and Boy Scouts, they made me a corporal. <laughs> I knew I'd set up a pup tent. <laughs> be that was gonna be real useful. Yeah, well, when nobody else know it does knows how. <laughs> so. Uh, well, tell me what Fort Sam was like when you when you got there. Don't have a whole lot of memories of okay. Fort Sam. Uh, you know, it's a a beautiful place being a permanent post. You know. Well, did you do your basic? No, no. that was that was just induction. Okay, it was just induction. Yeah. 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 yeah my basic was was at um, at Claiborne. Okay. Halfway through that, they sent us to Arkansas to work on a flood. You know, we we learned to be, build all kinds of stuff. You know, bridges and and stuff like that, uh, gin poles and shear legs and tripods and all kinds of stuff for moving equipment. But up in Arkansas, we were working on a flood of the White River. And uh, so we learned how to mattress slopes and, you know, to control seepage, how to build chimneys around sand boils mm -hmm. so they wouldn't wash the levee out. And, uh, we built a few bridges and, and then Went back to Saint. Went back to Claiborne and finished up. And just before they finished up, they came and asked me if I wanted to go to ASTP. And I said, well, "What's that?" And they said, "We don't know, but uh, uh, there's an Army Specialized Training Program." And uh, Nobody knew what it was, so anyway, they, they sent me back to college and I went first to LSU, which they called a STAR unit, which was some kind of an acronym, I think, but uh, only, it was just for casuals, and then they sent me up to Lake Forest College on a, 30 miles north of Chicago mm -hmm. on Lake Michigan. And, uh, so what was your training there? What were you taking coursework on? Well, it was about what, it was kind of like a pre-engineering, but it wasn't as much as I'd had at A&M. You know, I had some, some liberal arts stuff in there too, geography and all. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, anyway, uh, that was that started I think in September of '43, somewhere along in there, and along about in March of '44, well, they broke us up and <clears throat> sent us out to uh, California Desert, and uh, that's where we joined the. 104th Infantry Division. And at that time, the Infantry, Infantry Division has about 14, 15,000 men in it. And uh, they brought in 5,000 replacements from the ASTP into the, into the 104th. Wow. And they were coming off of desert maneuvers at the time. And then they took us from there up to uh, Camp um, Carson, Colorado. And we trained up there under General Terry Allen. Um, and we specialized in night fighting. And then uh, from there, they sent us overseas. I know this was unusual to have such a focus on night fighting. Can, can you talk a little bit about what that training was like? And um, one of the main things was on, on the attack, uh, that's the only place that made any difference, I suppose. And on the attack, while they would go in, Instead of being all spread out five yards apart, so that one bomb or grenade or shell didn't catch a whole bunch of you, you know, we went in column of twos with for front and flank patrols out to so where we didn't uh, hopefully run into any big surprises, no. And that way. They were able to keep control and not lose people. You know, get, get lost in the dark. Mm -hmm. And could sometimes get within, you know, one or two hundred yards of the, of the enemy before you, you had to spread out and go in and skirmish you, you see. So that was. Uh, probably the kind of the crux of it, right there. But you had to get used to the to the dark and that sort of thing. And, and they had a they put on a school there, uh, a division scout school. They called us the Wolf Scouts, and they brought in. See, I was in the uh, defense platoon of Division Headquarters Company. And that's just uh, basically three squads of anti-tank squads, you know, uh, uh, for this uh, for this school they brought in two men from each line company, which made quite a group, you know. Yeah. But from my platoon, they put, we had 18 guys in it. And, uh, and you know, we learned all kinds of night patrolling and, and how to find your way with a compass and all that kind of stuff. The whole whole bunch of stuff you learn that that way, you know. Well, did you have a sense, we haven't talked about how much you knew of what was going on with the war, but you're not training in the desert anymore, so you no. probably had to have an idea that... No, desert yeah. fighting was all over yes. with yeah. by that time. Yeah, yeah. So you knew at some point you were probably going to Europe. That was probably a pretty good guess. Yeah. Right? 
didn't look like jungle training, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the engineering, you pick civil, civil engineering on a whim or just because you didn't know what else to do. Did you enjoy that sort of work? It was most rewarding uh, to me. Not, I didn't get rich or anything, but uh, I had a very satisfying career in engineering. Well, I was commenting earlier on your uh, woodcraft is a, is a hobby of yours as well, and it kind of speaks to that, you know, creating and designing and building. Well, uh, it's very helpful in, in a way because I was, I was very good at drafting, and so I was able to, you know, design and, and plan my own projects. And, So when did you get uh, get an idea of where you were going next, where you're going to be deployed? Well, they sent us to Camp Clay, to Camp Kilmer, New Jersey, and uh, see, I was there during my twentieth birthday. And I had an uncle in New York who was um, manager of Saks Fifth Avenue, and I uh, was finally was able to get a, in touch with him and went out to his home and, and uh, met him for the first time in my life, you know. Yeah. But. Uh, Invasion had already taken place, so you know there's not much uh, doubt, I suppose, of where we were going. I guess, and we were the first ones to go from from uh, the United States directly to France. We landed at Cherbourg, and and it was about. 90 or 91 days after D-Day and uh, it had taken that long to cl- um, clear the peninsula and the port of um, Germans and obstacles I guess mm-hmm. so we are you know they anchored out and brought us in on lighters and, but some of them came uh, we went on a regular troop ship, you know, I guess it had been a luxury liner at one time, the George Washington. Someone went over on Liberty ships, which is what I'd built in Houston, mm-hmm. and landed at Utah Beach and waded ashore, you know, not under fire. Yeah. But yeah. That's how they got the feet wet ship. anyway. <laughs> well, do you remember, can you talk a little bit about the mood on the ship going over? Oh, I think everybody was in a pretty good mood. Um, they did a little zigzagging, but you know, I think the, the U boat threat was mostly taken care of by that time, you know. And uh, there's always some guys playing cards or uh, runner shell game, something like that, you know. Uh, but the last, I do remember though that they handed out some little bitty books and were stapled together, little booklet deals. And, and some guy was teaching us a few words of French, you know, how to pronounce it. And, you know, where's the railroad station and all that kind of stuff it was in, in his little book. And so we kind of, 
went in for that, you know. But then that little book, which I have since lost, uh, when we got over there, uh, when we finally got to where there were some people to try to talk to, uh, it was in Belgium, and it was in a Flemish part of Belgium, so the French equivalents didn't do much good. We, we were writing down a little, I was writing down a little Flemish equivalents, you know, and, and, uh, and we didn't stay in Belgium very long. Got over into Holland, so I was writing a little Dutch equivalents in there. Writing very small, of course. Uh-huh. And then I got into Germany and for a long time there wasn't anybody to talk to, but when we did find somebody while well, we were writing German equivalents down. So all, all of my lexicon of German and French and Flemish and Dutch is, is lost. <laughs> So, had you ever been overseas before? No. No, you'd never been overseas. So, what what was that like for the first time to be in Europe? Well, it was... damp. It was cold and damp. And... Uh, that was just in September and October, you know. Yeah. But uh, in in um, in the Cotentin Peninsula, you know, that's mm -hmm. that's where I'm really speaking of. <clears throat> Other places weren't that much different in climate, you know. But it was it was interesting. And in. Um, One of the places where we were in Belgium was on the grounds of the uh, Peter Paul Rubens home. They were Flemish painter. Mm -hmm. And of course that was where our headquarters was. We, we were in the huts that the Germans had left behind on the grounds, you know. And, uh, and we had been, the reason we were in there, in, in Belgium and Holland, was they had attached us to the Canadian First Army. And so anyway, we were there for a while and, and did all this stuff with the language thing, trying to get our clothes washed and everything, and finally got that done. And our uh, uh, clean leader came by and said, now, you, we're not supposed to go to Brussels. It's been reserved for the British. So you're not supposed to go there, it's off limits. And the trade station is right over there. So we uh, uh, immediately went off limits and had an evening in, in, in Brussels. I remember, uh, in her, I think he gave us a couple of dollars or something, uh, very, very little bit of money. And, and we, you know, didn't normally pay and you know, all. They gave us a little money. But here, of course, we're making combat pay by now. But um, we decided we wanted something to eat. And we saw a sign on this door for a restaurant. We went in, went up the stairs, went down the hall, into the hall. Uh, Man comes to the door. He's dressed up in a white tie and tails. And 
all these ladies and gentlemen were in there dining, you know. He, uh, he told us he didn't think we'd be comfortable in there. <laughs> and I'm sure we wouldn't, we couldn't have afforded a cup of coffee. <laughs> But uh, then we got into Holland, and uh, I, was, I watched some shoemakers making wooden shoes, and that was fascinating. Mm -hmm. They could just the skill and all of those guys and something. Uh, and they had where we were we'd replaced the British Infantry Division and there was a British Armored Division on one side of us and a Polish Armored Division on the other side of us. And uh, at about that time they, they issued the one and only time they ever gave us a liquor ration. They gave us a bottle of some kind of hooch and for our squad. And uh, the squad leader's name was Bruno Danny. She was a big Polish boy from Chicago. And some, some Polish guys went by in one of these Bren carriers, little, it's a fully tracked, vehicle about the size of a jeep and they stopped and he and he talked to him and he came back and he had a kind of a strange look on his face and he was asking us if we would donate the, our share of the liquor ration to him so he could entertain his Polish friends we said sure and uh, so they went over there and the three of them down this leader of whatever it was and he came back and he said you know I asked him um, I guess you guys will be going back to Poland pretty soon and they said yeah we think we will but we don't know what kind of a Poland to me that made no sense at that time but Made all kinds of sense. Yeah. The uh, you talked about encountering uh, like a Flemish group in Belgium, and once you had a chance to kind of interact with some of the uh, Europeans, how were you? Can you talk a little bit about how you were received, or kind of your interaction with citizens there? They were uh, they were friendly. Um, when we convoyed through France from Normandy to Belgium, which we were, the convoys go for miles and miles and miles, you know, and they stretch through village after farm after village after farm, you know. And we stopped every two hours whether they needed it or not, you know. Everybody would get out and do their business, and it didn't seem to bother the local ladies. They they came out and brought us a loaf of bread, you know, and stuff like that. And I remember when we were stopped like that one time. This well dressed gentleman, overcoat, uh, I don't know, hamburger bowler or something, some kind of hat and on, tie, all dressed up. Came walking by, and, and uh, I guess he had the same urge as we had, so he, he just pulled up to a garden gate there and did his business too. So you're just acting like the locals. 
Right. Just, just about. Yeah. Some young lady walked, drove by on a bicycle. It was a little bit much for her. All right. So you, you, uh, so your group pushed. You, you pretty much that area was secure. Getting to Belgium. When, when did you meet some resistance? In. Um, from from part of Belgium and into Holland. And see, being in the defense platoon of headquarters company, I, I wasn't on the front lines, you know, you understand that. But they, they fought their way into Holland. And the first night in Holland, we were out in the country, and uh, you're asking how they received us. Uh, this farmer, I noticed some guys lined up at this barn. It was not a high barn like ours, it was, but it was high enough, I guess. And uh, each man that went by, he'd pitchfork a, he'd give him a pitchfork full of hay, and he'd move on. So we each got a pitchfork full of hay. And I took that out in the pasture where I was to spend the night and I dug a trench long enough to lay down in and lined the, bo lined the bottom of it and put some willow sticks in there and lined the sides and, and put my shelter half over the top of it Cold blowing night, and I was just comfortable as in my own bed, you know. So but he was, he was, he was helping you. He was being, you yeah. know, yeah. he put that up for, for his cows to eat. Mm -hmm. Well, your group, the, the combat engineer group, what sort of work were y'all doing at that time? What were y'all focused on during that time? I was not a combat engineer group. Okay. I was in the defense platoon. I'm sorry, defense platoon. Division yeah. Yeah. And what that is is uh, uh, well, it had three squads of about ten men each, mm -hmm. and where armament is an anti tank. We have a 57 millimeter gun and a 50 caliber machine gun, a bazooka, and and we all have rifles and, and like that. And our, our job was securing headquarters so they didn't get blown away. And, mm -hmm. and uh, very good job as long as you're winning. That's right. And, <clears throat> and I forget what your question was. Well, I was just asked what y'all, uh, I was asking more kind of what y'all were doing in when you began to meet resistance, I guess you're just bearing down and preparing for yeah. a sort of... Well, they, yeah. yeah. They attacked them. Yeah. And drove them back. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of that was, you know, wading through icy water and everything like that, you know, really, really bad stuff. But from we were there in that Holland, I think, about you know, about three weeks, and then they brought us back into the American Army, and we moved 165 miles and uh, relieved the 1st Division at Aachen, and were able to have people in contact with the enemy uh, continuously, mm -hmm. both in Holland and in in Germany. So when we got through at the end of the war, we had 195 consecutive days in contact with the enemy. But uh, I had from Aachen on, that was a 
that had been a hard siege. And then the rest of that was, um, well, you know, the Siegfried line and all that kind of stuff. It went on into the town of Brand and then into Eschweiler and then into Weisweiler. In uh, Weisweiler, we spent a lot of time there. Uh, all during the boats. And in uh, Ishwire, my buddy and I, one of them decided we needed to go out and, and uh, fire some of our equipment. Uh, Armaments, you know, mm -hmm. that we hadn't had a chance to in the States and everything. So we had a little time for ourselves and we went off by ourselves. And took several things with us. We had an uh, ammunition ration that was given to us, you see, that just filled up the bed of the truck. And uh, we had a bazooka and, and uh, we had. We picked up a German machine gun and Panzerfaust and various things like that. Went off and fired them. We wouldn't bother anybody. Our gun was set up in the driveway of a filling station, looking down toward the front. And uh, so we got over there and we fired all of this stuff. The Panzerfaust. We fired the bazooka. We fired a German machine gun that was twice as fast as cyclic rate as ours is not there, you know. And then uh, the last thing we did was had a grenade. It was in a heavy drawn steel case. We didn't know what it was. We'd never seen it before. It said grenade smoke WP on it. Everything backwards, you know, in the Army too. And they smoked WP. And, uh, well, my buddy said, well, it's a smoke grenade. Said, well, I don't know about that. Anyway, uh, he pulled the pin, dropped it, and we started off. I said, let's get out of here. We began running, and by that time, thing went off, and there's a big shower of white phosphorus. <laughs> we ran out from under. <laughs> It had any good sense, you know. We got back to the building station where the gun was set up, and the guy that was on guard with the gun, and the rest of them had gone someplace to a movie or something. And he had a great mind, too. He had, you know, run on the same track. He, he took this grenade smoke WP around the side of the filling station, opened the door of the ladies' room, dropped it in John, and pulled the pin, you know, and dropped it in there. Closed the door. Afterthought, he stepped aside. By that time, the door went past. <laughs> Man. These are boys with big toys. Boys with big toys. <laughs> well, we uh, were always that crazy, but, yeah. <laughs> but uh, mm. there were exceptions. <laughs> well, um, you, you mentioned the bulge, and I, I know uh, that was a particularly hard time. Well, for us it was a boring time. Yeah, we were to the mm, just to the north of it. You know, just a little bit to the north of it. We could hear and see the noise and the flashes and everything else, but, it, but they weren't shooting at us. Mm -hmm. uh, but we had been 
at um, Weisswater. This was just on a mile or so from Eastwater. And I don't know why they moved only a mile, but they moved. And we'd been there a while. And got a three day pass to Kerberius, Belgium. And so we rode the truck back to Kerberius. <coughs> Got there, they took our rifles and the ordnance was supposed to have cleaned them or something, you know. Checked them, I suppose, cleaned them. We got a shower, first one. We got clean clothes, first time we did any clean clothes. And we go out to enjoy the town. And this was at a uh, Belgian barracks called a uh, caserna. And an MP at the gate says, 104th, go back. And so we went back and waited until midnight. And they said, well, load your rifles and get in the truck. Went back to the wastewater. That was our three day pass. Mm -hmm. That was. And I, that was the day the belt, the boat started. And they didn't know what anybody was. They thought we might run into something on the way back, you know. Mm -hmm. They didn't know. Um, but um, well, before that, before that happened. We had a fire in a house that one of the uh, squads was occupying. And no, it was after that, after I got back. Mm -hmm. And it was in the, uh, in the attic. They used straw up there for insulation. And someone would set it afire somehow with a stovepipe, I think. And we put it out, we got, must have had 100 guys out there with helmets, passing water from, you know, bomb hole or shell hole, mm -hmm. up to put out this fire. And we got through and finally got it out. And there went my shower, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, but uh, the company commander, I guess that was one of the nicest things he ever said to me. He said, oh, if I get another chance, I'll send you back to another three day pass and you get another shower. So, After things, after the balls got quieted down, we crossed the Royal River, and we made our way all the way to Cologne. And I think we were one of about three divisions that took Cologne. There was us and the uh, Third Armored Division, and I think one other infantry division that took Cologne. Mm -hmm. And we were there, and a, 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 the same buddy and I went down to the uh, see the cathedral. We find our way to get down there. You know, a lot of it blocked with rubble and everything. And. And while we were there, we looked at the cathedral and, and the crowd lobbed a shell in on us from across the river, you know, and, and it didn't hurt us, but it got a guy, uh, it got injured him a little bit, I don't know how bad, that we'd been talking to, 
Mm. From the Air Force, you know. But anyway, uh, it had been, you know, several weeks past since I'm talking about it. The company commander gave me a three day pass to Barbiers again. <laughs> and uh, so I went to Ruby Harris and had a nice three day pass this time. Came back, but didn't come back to Cologne. We got there, we went up the river and through Bonn, and then there was a pontoon bridge across the Rhine River. We went across on that, and when we did, when we were in the Remagen Bridgehead, you see. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when um, it's kind of kind of interesting that. Kind of key key moments. You know, the one was the ball started, and the other one was when we got into the into the bridgehead. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, while we were in this town of Hanif, which is where we were at the time, uh, some teenager came by when I was on guard on the on the gun, and. Uh, He was acting kind of strange, so I called him over, and, and he was carrying this Luger, which is sitting right over there. And, and so I, I got that from him, and I don't know, gave him a chocolate bar or something. And uh, that's kind of a prime uh, souvenir, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I know after, so, so there's quite a bit of momentum after when y'all started moving again. Oh, yeah, we're just blowing and going, yeah. uh, you know, 20, 30 miles a day sometimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, one of our regiments with the 3rd Army Division uh, made the Ruhr encirclement. And the rest of them were coming along behind and balling them up and everything like that, you know. And after that, then they started to push all the way across the the country, and it went real fast. And made a number of stops along the way, you know, it was a long distance and everything. And uh, but uh, just one day we made a little. Our squad squad usually operated by itself. Um, one one squad would move up and secure w with our platoon leader, you know, and we'd secure a site for our division headquarters. And the others would stay back guarding and move up with the, with the rest of them, and that sort of thing. And he took us a little ways into the Harts Mountains, and decided we were in the wrong place. Turned around, and went back. But his language problems. He was trying to ask people where the German army was, and they said, well, you know, pointed like that. He took it that there was a house a few hundred yards down the road there. So he ordered us to put a shot through it. And we did. The old man came running down, you know, no, no Sadat, no, no, no Sadat. 
one right. thing that you mentioned earlier that I wanted to go back and ask about um, the Allies. You, you're connected to this Canadian. What was the opinion of the Canadians, and what was the interaction like with that Canadian group? Being in the Canadian Army, uh, but I was a British Corps, and so all we saw was, no, we did see, we saw some Canadians, we saw some British, we saw some Polish. Um, well, they, uh, they had a little different outlook than we did, you know. We were in the middle of a conversation. They said, oh, tea time, cheerio. And, well, go off and, and uh, you know, light a fire and, and heat up their water for tea. And uh, in this one in the little town there, where I saw the wooden shoemakers, the main, there's, I don't know, all I know is there were uh, two main streets that are intersected in a T, and and then one, the stem of the T went over a dike, and I didn't get any farther in it than that. And we were in that in that intersection, and there was a park there. And beyond that was a school. Well, the, the park was occupied by a battalion of British tanks, and then uh, we had the MPs on the corner, both British and American. Americans stayed there 24 hours a day. British at midnight, they they left. Uh, Anybody out after midnight on the general want to know where they're going. <laughs> the way they looked at it. And they... They... Uh, they had two guards marching around that park all the time. Just, or we'd, we'd stay in the shadow and if you come by us so while we'd when you get by and challenge you to your back. <laughs> but these guys were walking guard. And they had oh, uh, they had hobnails on their shoes mm -hmm. and their boots. And then in their heels there was a horseshoe set into the heel. Boy, they made a lot of racket, you know, walking. And, uh, and the Canadians, they were talk to, talking about the British rations. They said they were ter terrible they were. They said, you guys would quit. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I guess we got along pretty good. <laughs> I saw Montgomery one time, he came to our headquarters. Saw him at a distance. Did you, did you have a, uh, much of a sense of kind of the mood of the headquarters and what was going on, kind of activity with it? No. Uh, It was just like, um, you know, we knew all about map reading and I never saw a map, uh, except in Stars and Stripes, you know, about that size. Um, we, we didn't know what was going on. Like, the, whatever, you know, if you're right in the, in the headquarters. I know General Allen stayed with the 104, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. And he was the only one, I think, in World War II that commanded two different divisions. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Um, 
He commanded the first division in Africa and Sicily. And uh, he got crosswise with some of the higher generals and they sent him, they relieved him without prejudice. But he went, went back and they gave him another division, which was us. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a very beloved general, uh, especially after where you know, came to all our reunions until he died and everything, you know. But uh, the, but we, we felt like we had, um, we always got there first and had the lowest casualties. Uh, do <coughs> doing some part, you know, to our training and night fighting, and and also just uh, aggressive spirit, I guess. Did morale stay pretty high, pretty good? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can see those guys. You know, after they'd been fighting for a long time, no, they, they got the thousand yard stare. You know, just exhausted, that sort of thing. But, uh, uh, after this little foray into the Hearts Mountains, we've, I, th I think we were lost. <laughs> Wouldn't have been unusual with that particular officer. Uh, we went to a town called Dudershot and spent the night. And uh, in Dudershot, we, uh, met a couple of guys. One of them was from the 106th Infantry Division, which had been wiped out practically in the bulge. And so he had been a prisoner, had been, they marched him to the east, and then they marched him back to the west, you know. They get too close to the front on either side, and then they started him back east again. And this guy told him he was sick. And they didn't shoot him, they, they left him behind. So he was there when we got there. And another little guy who was a, a Jewish guy, I think. He, he wasn't, wasn't an army, wasn't a soldier. And he's, and uh, was just, he's getting, the soldier hadn't had anything to eat. And I went in a bakery and they had one loaf of bread and I made them give it to me. Uh, I thought since of it, I should have given it half back to him, but I didn't. And we had plenty of food, but uh, it wasn't where their kitchen hadn't gotten there, you know. So I wanted to feed the guy a little bit. He was starving. and. So anyway, this Jewish guy said, well, I can tell you where we can get eggs. So the next morning before dawn, we started out and we went out in the country a few miles and we, he went up and I stayed with a vehicle and he went up and rapped on the window, woke the people up, came back with a hundred eggs. And so we took them to t back to town and and we're feeding this guy that was starving, you know. And he would say, well, I was, I'm gonna be sick. I'm gonna be sick. You go ahead and eat it anyway. And then the following day was when we went, reached uh, 
going to house them. Okay. Well, what did you know of the camps and uh, I mean, how much awareness had you had of the camps before we get to that? Zero. Zero. Never heard of it. We pulled into Nordhausen in the afternoon. We found these apartment buildings. They were quite nice. Uh, fairly large buildings. And there were several of them. They were spaced maybe 100 feet apart, something like that. Out behind them, they had little gardens. You know, a little strip of garden for each apartment. And most of them would have a rabbit hutch. You know, they'd, they'd raise her rabbits for meat and all. And we kicked occupants out of an apartment for our squad. And we went in there. And after we'd been in there a while, um, one of the guys came up and he had a funny look on his face and says, come with me. And we all went over next door. We got next door and there was a stink coming out of there, a big stench. And we went in there and our, our medics were in there and they had all of these people that were nearly dead. And they were you know, feeding them a little teaspoon at a time of hot chocolate or something, you know. But if they fed them very much, they'd get sick and die. Get sicker and die, you know. They were just barely alive. And, uh, and the smell was the smell of death. And so they told us where it came from. Where it came from. We all got in our truck and we went out there to the camp. On the way we we saw, you know, an older man, you know, made him get on the truck with us and go out there. We didn't bring anything back. And we got out there and I know I didn't see all of it. The, uh, what I saw was all of these dead people laid outdoors there on the ground and it looked like acres of them and, and they were you know they've been, been living in there and, and and there was others in there that were they hadn't brought out and and all in the, just a terrible scene. And what we what we didn't see at all was the underground factories that they had. See, that was back under the Hearts Mountains that I told you about. We uh, they had these underground tunnels back under the Hearts Mountains, and these were slave laborers who were built were working on the buzz bombs. And and uh, V2 rockets. The V1s yeah. and I think also the V2s. We saw a lot of V1s go by. Uh, and all in you. Had a distinctive noise to their engine, you know. And then you'd hear the engine cut off and you know, I was going into a dive and everything. There was a, <clears throat> pictures there. Of, Let's see, yeah, in Nordhausen. Nordhausen. Yeah. Uh, we heard since that they call it Middle, Dora Middleburg or something like that. Dora Middle Valley. Nor a middle, nor a middle mile. But uh, we just knew it as Nordhausen. And so, what did you do once you got into the camp? 
they, they were working to to get. We the, didn't do anything. Yeah, they were they were trying to get the the ones that yeah. there could be had a chance of saving. Our medics were working with on them, mm -hmm. and they did just tremendous labor to, yeah. to try and save those people and all. But, yeah, uh, it's hard for you know people now to understand what it was you saw, and you know that this sort of horror and death that you saw, may not. Well, it, uh, it still bothers me. We went back to her apartment, and the guys in my squad were Finding young men as they come, you know, um, or just well, uh, uh, nobody was saying a word, you know, it just almost like they'd forgotten how to talk or something, you know what I mean? It, was, it just affected him so much. And the occupant of the apartment came and wanted to get something out of the refrigerator, I don't know, milk for a baby or something, which you can't imagine anybody saying no. The guy that met him at the door said no. Said no. Well, just uh, it's just kind of beyond words. You know, we've seen we've seen a lot of a lot of dead. You know, but nothing like that. Nothing that really prepared you for. You said now you still think of it. Is there a time where? Is there something that kind of causes you to think of it, or like now when you think about it, you had said it still bothers you. Well. Uh, Well, it didn't haunt me or anything sure. like that, but when it comes up and start talking about it like this, well, they kind of... Would you like a cold Coke? Yeah. I think we're, we're okay. Water? I'm glad you took a drink, though. So, I know you, your voice gets... throat gets dry after a little while. Well, um, so we've got cancer in the esophagus, and it's producing mucus all the time. And it makes my voice gurgly, gurgly and everything, you know. And messes it up pretty good. Did, as we talk about this experience of you, did, did it change how you felt about the enemy that you were fighting? in the war after you saw that? Um, I would say so. I mean, we, you know, you can't, you can hardly imagine that kind of brutality, you know. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of it. There was a massacre of American troops in the bulge, you know. The, what they call it, I can't remember. Malmedy? 
They what? Malmedy. Malmedy Mass yeah. Massacre, yeah. Because that made everybody mad. It really did. Yeah. So, so how long did y'all stay in Nordhausen? I think we moved the next day. And uh, we, uh, we um, made several more stops, you know, before we got to the end of the road. And uh, where we ended up was a town called Delich. And uh, that was on the Muldy River tributary of the Elbe and uh, between the between the Muldy and the Elbe it was supposed to be kind of a, uh, no man's land or something you know and, uh, Russians stopped at the Elm and we stopped at the Maldi. So you didn't have any interaction with the Russians? Well, uh, our uh, recon troops sent a patrol over there and, and they made it all the way across, you know, which going through territory held by Germans, you know, and the Germans let them through, and they, they made contact with the Russians across the river, and got good and drunk. I've heard a lot of that happen. Yeah, and then, uh, <clears throat> uh, the, they invited the Russian Division commander over to meet our general, and uh, the defense platoon was constituted as an honor guard for this Russian general, and this was planned, you know, some days in advance, mm -hmm. and they they took our helmets and. Took them and varnished them, and put the division insignia on the timber wolf on the front of it. You know, perfect target. And and they gave each of our squads a flat iron and a can of shoe polish. Did you get to take another shower? No shower. No shower. Just 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 uh, just wind dressing. Well, I don't think I don't think the Russians could have smelled us anyway. But uh, uh, actually, I think we were probably showering in local facilities there. But, yeah. but um, you know, we ironed our our pants and ironed our jackets. Ironed our shoes, shirts, and we ironed our shoes. The reason that's necessary is that they were, their shoes were made with the rough side out. You couldn't polish them. So we, we shined them down with a flat iron and where they're a little bit slicker, you know, and, and then polished them the best we could. <laughs> and. Uh, and then we were the honor guard when the when the Russian general, but they they, they threw him over in a in a spotter plane, I think, and brought him in in a jeep or command car or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
our headquarters there at Delish was in a place called the Chocolate Factory. It was built in a square, you know, with a hollow inside and, and everything. We secured that. And uh, we were there for at least one night or maybe two, at least one night. We were there for two nights before the uh, headquarters moved in. So our, our little 10 man squad had this whole big building, you know. And uh, somebody had gone and gotten a, a German uh, water can and it filled with um, Everclear medical alcohol. We had quite a party on that. We cut it with uh, grapefruit juice. This is while you were securing the fam? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. We had somebody on guard, don't it? Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, we were had a pretty good little party there. So you were in Delitz when you heard of the surrender. I'm trying to remember. Yeah. Um, we were in Delitz for a good little while. Yeah. And you know, they stopped and you know, festivities stopped and everything. But um, I can't really remember where I was when when the VE did it came back. It must have been there. Well, you you remember? I'm, I'm sure you remember how you felt when you heard the news. Not good. <laughs> yeah. Damn. From Dallas, we had passed through a city called Holly on the way to Dallas, it's about 30 miles, I think, something like that. And uh, it was a beautiful, beautiful town and hadn't been beat up too bad. And they tried to get him to, you know, move out or surrender or something, you know, so we wouldn't have to tear the town down, you know. And it was mixed results, but uh, I think I ended, ended up having to tear about a third of it down uh, to get them, get the Germans out of there and all. But they saved all they could. They, they, they tried their very best. Which is, Pretty hard to do when you have other objectives in mind. Well, I know you saw a lot of devastation once you got into Germany. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, a whole lot of it. And uh, in from Delhi, they sent me back to Holly. There was an airfield there. German airfield, and they told me to go back there and and pick up some men at the uh, city hall, the burgomaster's office, take them out there and clean out some barracks. And uh, so I did that. I got a lunch from the cook, you know, and went over there and picked these guys up. And, Took them up there and got them, got them busy, and they had a foreman, and 
<clears throat> they didn't need me, so I ran around the town some, you know, and everything. End of the day, well, I took them back to the city hall. Next day, I did the same thing. It was Monday and Tuesday. And uh, finished up several barracks here, big ones. Finished up them on Friday. And uh, I don't know why, but I, uh, I got on the te telephone and the regular telephone system was working. I got, I got into division, into my company. I said, okay, I finished what I'll do now. They said, what, didn't we give you, tell you not to do that? And they'd, they'd called it off, you know, mm -hmm. and told everybody it was me, I guess. So I got about a week's sort of vacation, you know. And uh, anyway, then later on, though, we went ahead and moved over there, so all the cleaning I did was uh, useful. Mm -hmm. So, um, so how long did you stay in uh, in Germany? I mean, the war's over. Oh, war's yeah. over. Yeah. Um, not very long. Yeah. Um, I've got this division history here. Uh, we, we were there a few weeks, but uh, but uh, being one of the le later ones to get over there, we were one of the first ones to come back. Now, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Uh, the idea was that uh, they were they were going to have tra trainers for Japan. Mm -hmm. And so from Holly, we went in a motorcade to Leipzig. Leipzig, we got on trains, left all of our equipment, all of our trucks, heavy guns, everything. Oh, these 40 and 8 trains. I've got pictures of them. You know, 40 and 8 was uh, you know, back to World War One. Little bitty box cars with four wheels. And they got stenciled on the inside of them, their capacity. Either 40 horses or 40 men or 8 horses. And uh, they had 32 of us on there. 40 would have been standing room only. And we rode those for four days and four nights uh, till we got to a place called Camp Lucky Strike. That was at La Harve. And from La Harve we went back to New York and arrived, I think, about the 4th of July. You know, Fireboats and dancing girls and everything, and, and then they gave us from there furlough. I think we got 30 days actually at home, and then we went out to the west coast, Camp San Luis Obispo, and uh, we were trained to go into Japan in November. I'm gonna stop and go see what now if okay. she needs me. Okay, all right, sure. All right, so you're on your way back to the States, or did you know at that point, or y'all having conversation about what's next? While the four nights and four days you're on the train? Nah. Nah. <laughs> you're looking for more Everclear and the grapefruit. <laughs> So. No, but we had our box car that we were in didn't have a good roof on it, you know. And of course, it was always raining, and every time the train lurched by here, come a sheet of water down through the joints in the roof, you know. And, uh, after a night of that, we 
saw a carload of potatoes with a big tarp over it, so when we left that time, when I had, the tarp was on our box car, a little more, a little more comfortable after that. Kept you dry. Yeah. And then the last two nights, I got up on top there and cut a hole in the tarp and crawled under it. So I had a place to lay down all the way, you know, without having my feet on somebody and that sort of thing. <laughs> You're creative. Yeah. So now, so you had reported back in August in California. Mm -hmm. So you were there training when you heard the news. Yeah, training had not really started yet. Okay. But we were there in August. And okay. Do you remember when you heard the news of the bomb being dropped? Yes, yes. And then the surrender. Yeah. What was your, uh, do you remember what your thoughts were when you heard about the, the bombing of the first bomb? Or, well, know? there Sound, sound of good does, yeah. When the news of VE, VJ came, well, that was that was big news. You know? Yes. Yeah. yeah, because for what you knew, as you said, you were preparing for an invasion of the yeah. Japanese mainland. Yeah. Didn't know at that time. Didn't know when, but you know they didn't tell us anything. But I found out since it was. They had the date already set for us in November. Mm -hmm. Well, so uh, so VJ Day happens. You're in California. I know there was celebration. What was the mood like? How'd y'all celebrate? I don't remember particularly. Yeah. Uh, I know we were. Everybody was all happy about it and everything. You were anxious to get back to Texas. Yeah, they they soon started discharging. And they had a point system, and uh, they gave you a priority, you know, and and uh, I got home in time for Christmas. Well. Um we had we skipped that part. We talked about it before we started interviewing, but you'd gotten married. We didn't even talk about that part. Well, I didn't get married till 1950. Well, you had met this girl. I'm sorry, you had met this. I thought y'all. I didn't met. meet her till 1950. Oh, okay. Well, I, didn't, I thought you'd met her earlier. No. You met her in 1950. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And married soon after that. Pretty quick after that. Yeah. yeah I graduated from A and M and. In uh, January of '50, and I met her in April, and married her in November. So, did you go back at to A and M fall of '46? I guess. Um, spring of '46. Spring of '46. So there were a lot of GIs. I'm sure. Yeah, most of them were GIs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I uh, went to the spring spring semester in summer, <coughs> both summer terms, and then I uh, dropped out and worked in the fall semester. And I went back and uh, finished in four years, you know. Well, I'd like to hear the story again for the record about how you met your wife. Your mother was involved. I remember you telling me that. My mother had, <coughs> had been working in a children's store and 
her mother had grandchildren that came in to buy stuff, you know. They had her, her, her father had rented a, a house there in Bryan for the for the summer, and Ellen, her mother had come out and spent the time with him there. So my mother came home, and I was, see, I had lived at home while I was going to a &M. I missed quite a bit of the experience by doing that, but anyway, that was, um, and I'd got a job with a construction company on <clears throat> building a building on the campus when I, when I got out of school. So I was still staying at home and uh, I'd just gotten started there. Anyway, mother came home and said, I met a woman who had a pretty daughter and I want you to come meet her and we can go call on her. I said, okay. So anyway, we went and called on them. And before long, I was going down there after supper every night. They didn't eat till late, till I, so I'd eat another supper down there. Their mother was an outstanding cook, and so was she. Mm -hmm. Y'all were married not too long after that, I know. Yeah, we, uh, I think we courted for about three months and then mm -hmm. uh, separated for about three months when I moved to Dallas to another construction job. Got cramps. Uh, Came to Dallas with some friends one weekend, and other than that, we didn't see any see each other. Mm -hmm. But um, finally, <clears throat> told my boss, I "Want to get married?" He said, "Well, that's fine." Well, I want some time off to get married. He said, "Well, you got the whole weekend. What are you talking about?" And uh, <laughs> so that was how we decided to get married uh, the day after Thanksgiving. And then uh, I just didn't show up on Friday. And, and But I showed up on Monday. <laughs> Short honeymoon. Short honeymoon. So you made your business in construction. That's what you made. You said you. That's how I started yeah. out. Okay. But uh, um, I stayed with the the um, general contractor just one year, and then I worked went to work for consulting engineers, and. And the first one I worked for was called Foot and Cook and Fowler. And they had a city county bond issue, road and bridge bond issue. And I got, eventually became their bridge design engineer. And uh, when that was about to wind up, well then I went to work for a, Structural engineer named R.C. Stokes. Worked for him for about two years. And then uh, I got a job with uh, another consulting engineer that had several contract sections of I 35E. So I worked for them for one year, and that was. All of these were very.
informative and instructive for me and everything. And, and, uh, and then at the end of this one year, they were, I don't know, politics got into it to where they didn't hire my boss back for any further uh, uh, freeway work mm -hmm. because they had to get some others, some other consulting engineers that they didn't want. I see. Yeah. So they well, we just won't do it at all. Mm -hmm. So that's when I went to work for Dallas Water Utilities, known as Dallas City Water Works at that time. I went to work for them in uh, February of 1958. That was right at the right after the end of the biggest drought that That's had right. ever been in record in Dallas, Texas. Mm -hmm. Broke in the spring of '57. From '50 to '57. What was Dallas's water situation at that point when you came on? Well. They had dug the way out of it a bit, but it was it was still pretty dicey. But we were here all, all during that time that of the drought, and and their main water supply was Lake Dallas. And Lake Dallas was basically out of water, and they had to go up to the Red River and get all that salt laden water out of it, and. Every other well that they could reactivate, you know, they they used every possible source of water during that time, and all that water from the Red River, where it killed, killed all the azaleas and other salt intolerant plants, and rusted out all the water pipes and all the hot water tanks. Yeah. Boy, at the end of that period of time, Dallas, uh, citizens of Dallas had the best water piping and the best water tanks you can imagine. <laughs> they all had to be replaced. That's right. So I guess that Ray Hubbard is a response to that building, Lake Ray Hubbard, and having that as a... Didn't Dallas develop that as a water source? I think right after that. Um, Lake Louisville was Lake under Lewis. construction okay. at, uh, at that time. Okay. And then... Uh, and of course we got some water rights in, in uh, Lake um, Grapevine, relatively small amount. Mm -hmm. And we got a little bit of water rights in Lake Le Pond, and we got a major water right in Lake Tewakini, and in Lake Ray Hubbard, uh, the only one that we own and operate lock, stock, and barrel. But uh, and since then, they've also brought, gotten uh, uh, Lake Fork Reservoir, and they have a, a water right in Lake Palestine that has not been uh, put to use yet. They also built another one above Lake um, Lake Louisville, which is Lake Ray Roberts. Mm -hmm. Well, now, how long were you with the, the uh, Dallas Water? Almost 32 years. 32 years. Long career. You saw a lot yeah. of changes. Yeah, yeah. It was it was a really good job for me. Um, in all of them, my jobs, I guess, uh, 
I was able to make use of most everything I learned and and uh, was able to do anything I was, thought I was big enough to do, you know. <laughs> well, one thing I know we talked about earlier that you, you've done is you've gone to uh, reunions or meetings of the 104. Can you talk a little bit about that? In the first many years, I didn't go to any of them. Okay. Uh, except they have one here in 68, I think they had in Dallas, and I went to part of that. But then the last number of years, I went to as many as I could. Since your retirement? Yeah. 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 I can't, I, you know, in the early days, I didn't care much about it. But I, my attitude changed with, with time and all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what does it mean to you now to be able to go? Um, I don't, don't see but maybe one or two that I w had known in the service. But you meet a lot of people that you can you know, if they're if they're a timber wolf, you can talk to them and swap stories. And everybody went to the same places, some to some extent, but nobody had the same experience. And so it's it's really interesting and and enjoyable in that way. And also, it's a very uh, patriotic and spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. well, what? And, I'm sorry. And, uh, you know, they'll always have a, you know, a great speaker there and all that sort of thing. Um, one thing I'll mention particularly one of the little towns that we uh, liberated in, in in Holland. Uh, the mayor of that town came several times and to be our keynote speaker. They they remember us and they appreciate us, and they a couple of their towns renamed their main street, or maybe their own street, Timberwolfstrasse, you know. And, and uh, so, and they've had, which I've never been able to take part in, but they've had battlefield tours, you know, many of them, and a lot of them go back there, you know. And Retrace the steps of the... Yeah. And that was, time-wise, that was, that, that was just a small interlude of our whole time over there. But uh, those people are kind of special, and they don't forget, and they teach their children. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have some reenactment groups that, uh, they have our uniforms, they have our equipment, you know, Jeeps. They have just about everything like that. And every, uh, I think it's October, they have what they call their March to Remember. And some of them have little museums in their garages or something, you know. It's got to be great to be able to share that with the guys that you were in the 104 with. Yeah. Yeah, it's... It's really been a joy being able to go there and... and, and uh, 
Nell has gone with them with me to two of them, one in New Orleans, which was real good, and one in uh, Little Rock. Uh, aside from that, uh, she's been like this and you know, unable to go or to stay by herself. And so her daughter Nancy would take her a day off from her teaching job, stay with her and her husband and the two grandsons would go with me. Mm -hmm. And so that in itself has been very rewarding. Mm -hmm. And the younger grandson, Paul, uh, is a bagpiper. And uh, so he's taking his pipes with him and played a tune for us at the reunion, you know. That's neat. Well, uh, are there some things I should have asked you about that uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about? Well, I think you did a great job, really. Uh, if working by myself alone, I would just go chronologically and mm -hmm. interminably. <laughs> 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 and, but this way we got quite through quite a bit of it. Mm -hmm. Anything we missed we should have talked about? Well, uh, Done a bit of hunting, mm -hmm. and quite a bit of woodworking. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do you enjoy with woodwork? What do you primarily do? Um, pretty wide variety. Um, I did some of the things in this room. And then I've done um, things from a church. Mm -hmm. I've been, I've got a lot out of making stuff for the church, you know. Mm -hmm. I made one cross that hangs over the altar, it's 10 foot high, and Celtic cross. And uh, I made this shelf and uh, took a few carving lessons and made that. Oh wow, that's beautiful. And I made those out of some kind of whiskey boxes over there, you know. When I first started out, mm -hmm. I thought, my case there, and those things there, these shelves. Mm -hmm. Do you that's still do any woodwork? Well, I still got my shop, and and uh, I haven't been doing any, but I'll, uh, I'm not saying I quit either. You haven't. I know you haven't. <laughs> well, one thing that you mentioned there that I'd like to ask, um, you know, it, again, just one more question. Looking back on kind of that Nordhausen experience, and you're a person of faith, and you're a person whose faith is important to you and, and just looking back on that experience um, I mean how have you thought about it how have you processed it, processed it as you think about just what you saw well I wish I could give you something profound on that but I can't it's um It was just a time when people were doing horrible things and they're still doing horrible things. And yeah, you, you saw the worst of what men can do to each other.
Pretty much. Pretty much. We saw other places in this town of Dudershot that I mentioned to you. There were some the whole barracks there laborers, both men and women, they're all in the same barracks. And I, I don't think they were I know they were working them, but I don't think they were abusing them so bad there that I could tell. But with having having freed them, you know, now they were kind of getting into a riotous mood, you know, and trying to storm the liquor store and stuff like that. Mr. Reynolds, that you've been generous with your time today. Well, you're the one who's been generous to come all this distance and everything, and I hope I haven't bored you to tears or anything. But. Well, Robert DeBoard's here with us too, who's helping with the interview, and I know both of us would like to thank you for your service to our country well, and the you. things you did for us sitting here years later. Well, you're more than welcome.